Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure and honor to introduce a visiting scholar, um, Dr. Tracy Guthrie, who will be speaking with us today about racism in academic psychiatry. For those of you who need continuing education credits, the code for today is 548. So if you text that into the Cloud CME account, you'll be able to get your credits. If you look in the chat function, uh, you'll be able to see instructions on just how to do that if you have not set up your account yet. So it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tracy Guthrie. She's the program director for the General Adult Psychiatry Residency at Brown University. She's also an assistant dean for diversity in the Division of Biology and Medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. She's an associate professor, clinician educator in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. She received her medical degree from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, and she fled the cold winters there for the more temperate climate of New England and completed her psychiatry residency at Brown, where she was also chief resident. She has been recognized for her dedication to teaching with multiple honors, including the Psychiatry Resident Award to Talented and Learned Educators, the Dean's Excellence in Teaching Award, Outstanding Teaching Award in Psychiatry, the Triple Board Program Teaching and Advocacy Award, and the Resident Award for Outstanding Clinician. She is currently the 2023 Program Chair Elect for the American Association of Directors of Psychiatry Residency Training. She is the first person of color to hold this position. In 2026, she will ascend to become the president of ADPERT. And again, today she'll be speaking with us on racism and academic psychiatry, hiding beneath the cloak of our benevolence. It is really a pleasure and honor to turn the grand rounds over to Dr. Guthrie. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm really flattered uh, to be here to talk with you today, and I hope to leave some time for questions uh, at the end of the talk. It's very difficult to find words to express what's happening in our country right now. It's one year of dealing with COVID-19, one year after George Floyd's murder, with the trial currently ongoing and re-traumatizing many, and anti-Asian violence that is indescribable. I'm here before you not as an expert with all the answers, but as a physician and an educator. I'm trying very hard to bear witness, to be present, to question acts and behaviors, to learn, to grow, and to maintain hope. Over the past year, especially over the past year, I realized that there are times when my training as a physician truly helps me. The evaluation of data, how to educate myself about a new threat like COVID-19, how to lean on science. And there have been times this year when I've reached for something in my training to help guide me, and there is nothing there. How do I be an advocate? How do I act on a greater public health scale? How do I use my power in this instance? It's then when I'm trapped by my own words that I say to my residents. I tell them, you will not learn everything during your training, so stop trying. Your residency training will be a wonderful foundation. It will serve you well, but it will not always be enough. I tell them that they will have to keep learning, but more importantly, keep growing as a person in order to be the psychiatrist that they set out to become. And so it seems do I. I wanna be clear that while this talk is focused on the history and present of psychiatry's treatment of black people, I have no intention to exclude anyone. You may see yourself in this talk in the many ways that you identify with how you worship your gender, your sexuality, your gender identity, your ability, where you were born, the languages you speak or any combination therein. I would like to say to you that you have not been left out as my colleague and friend, Pat Poitvian, the Pediatric Program Director at Brown and the present elect of the Association of Pediatric Program Directors is fond of saying, my arms are wide enough for all of you. Presentations on diversity, inclusion, equity, and racism often start with a disclaimer. Stating that we should all be open, hear each other, not judge, be responsible for your own feelings and don't project them onto others. 
I really am hopeful that there'll be a time when we no longer need such a disclaimer. That the academic environment should always be about growth, sharing and learning without judgment. But I suppose we have not yet arrived at this place. That we are still fearful about talking about race and inequity. We feel judged, we see, feel concerned for our careers and we speak about what we know to be true. Nobody here caused this problem, but it is within our power to solve it if we take the time to understand it, if we can muster the courage. Many presentations about diversity, inclusion, equity, and racism focus on many important topics such as health equity, health care disparities, the sequelae of structural racism like redlining. But I want to focus on us, us as members of this elite group of academic psychiatrists, researchers, educators, and learners, people with privilege and power. Let's start where we often do with a case presentation. For some reason I can't, here we go. A patient is referred to you by a colleague. The patient has been in and out of therapy with multiple different psychiatrists over many, many years. They present to your office with symptoms of depression, anxiety, insomnia, and a string of failed relationships. They've had multiple employers over the last several years, never really being able to quote, find the right fit. When you first meet the patient, they reveal a significant history of trauma that they make clear they never wanna discuss. The mere mention of trauma or of quote, the past or any other such euphemism sparks outrage or periods of quiet sadness that is quickly brushed away by the patient and the topic is changed. The patient consistently comes to therapy and desperately wants to get better, saying that they will do anything, anything to get better, anything but deal with the past. In the case presentation, I did not provide you with any identifying data. I'm sure you came up with an image in your head of what the patient looked like. But in this case example, I'm referring to us, psychiatrists and other mental health professionals we are the patient. We are the ones with an unlearned, unreconciled and unprocessed past. We are the ones that avoid our past. It's ugly, it's dark, and we feel responsible in some way, perhaps in different ways for it. We feel like a victim at times of our past. So we bury it, we wanna talk about it, but yet we keep saying we wanna get better, keep trying. It's hard to process the past when you've not been told the truth, when the history you have been taught is different from the truth. The history I'm referring to is not only American history and the glossed over atrocities committed against people of color, but the history of psychiatry and our part in perpetuating racism. The patient is us, we are afraid and or we do not want to or know how to change things. But we have been told the same thing repeatedly for many, many years. Like the patient case, we have been offered advice, told what to do, offered a treatment plan of sorts, yet we keep saying, we want to get better, but don't know how. This book, Racism in Psychiatry, was written in 1972. It examines how racism influences the practice of psychiatry. I'm not sure about you, but this was not on my reading list in training. I had to dig deep to find a copy of it on a secondary market on Amazon. It reviews the history of slavery and medicine and the false statements about the intelligence, physiology, and emotionality of Black people from the rationale of bondage supported by Dr. Samuel Cartwright, who described the condition of trapelomania, the flight from home madness, to explain why slaves run away, to false claims of genetic differences, to the theories of disadvantage or deficit of all black people. This book came on the heels of this article from the APA Green Journal. The article is from a special section of the APA Journal in 1970, December 1970 to be exact. It was a direct result of black psychiatrists demanding racial equity from the board of the APA in 1969. They requested nine specific things, but in response, the board provided a non-voting position for black psychiatrists and space in the journal for this special section. There were a few other companion articles within this series one about the problem of training black psychiatrists in predominantly white training institutes. If you read this article from the Green Journal, you would think it was written yesterday. The authors called on the American Psychiatric Association to quote, end the traditional exclusion of blacks from positions of influence and authority, close quote. 
to remind you, the American Psychiatric Association had its first and only black president in 2018, Dr. Alpha Stewart. The American Psychological Association had two black presidents to date, one in 1972, Dr. Kenneth Clark, known for many things, but most significantly being the doll test. The experiment that showed black children when given the choice preferred to play with a white doll over a black doll. They make disparaging comments about the black doll and therefore themselves. The second black president came in 2017, Dr. Jessica Henderson Daniel. But back to our article. They further called on psychiatry departments to recruit more black residents and faculty and make professional training more relevant to the needs of black people. Does this sound familiar? The article reminds the reader of disparities in access to care and limited time in care if present as compared to whites. And they also take, take aim at racism and the black psychiatrist and institutional racism and psychiatric research. And <clears throat> um, to put this in a concrete context, a concrete timeline, the APA meeting when this request was made was in 1969, the same year I was born. I'm sorry, this is Dr. Alpha Stewart, the first um, black president of the American Psychiatric Association. We managed to slip out of facing this all the time by maintaining our ignorance, by shielding ourselves with our geography. By geography, I mean living in the Northern States. Seth Rockman, Associate Professor of History at Brown was part of a panel discussion on race and slavery in America, sponsored by the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. He spoke about the sale of black bodies and creation of economic capital, but specifically the economic entanglements of the North where we are all now. Despite the abolishment of slaveholding in the North, the textile and industrial revolution simply offshored slaveholding to the South to separate itself from the nasty business of slavery, but all the while reaping the benefits. It's where most of the wealth came from. But when you read a history book, you simply learn of the industrial revolution, nothing more. Benevolence, we all want to be perceived as benevolent well-meaning, kind, and giving. And we are. We treat a disenfranchised population of those suffering from mental illnesses. But I want to say to you that it is not enough. We have more to do to live up to our oath, more to do to be able to be called benevolent because we have been selective or more appropriately ostracizing, and we have left many populations out. I'm in the middle of reading this book now. I wish I had found it a little bit um, sooner so that I could have given it a full re review. But I do think it is worth mentioning so far that it's providing a well-researched view of the connections between slavery, psychiatric asylums, politics, money, and power. An interesting, although difficult read for sure. Really unmasking us and our benevolence in psychiatry. But to get a broader view, there was a review in the journal Nature about the book. And they reveal that the question that frames this book is how does a culture that enslaved people, encouraged lynching and developed racial segregation decide who is and who is not sane? Additionally, rather than asking how slavery might have devastated an individual psyche, physicians treating newly freed Amer African-Americans discussed how their mental health may have been harmed by emancipation. This is our history. When will we uncloak? When will we make the invisible visible? When will we see things as they are? In this extensive week-long 2006 series in the new newspaper, The Providence Journal, Paul Davis is one of our many therapists, encouraging us to see that the way out is through reconciling with our past. Many believe and they believe this because they were taught this, that the Northern states were not involved in slavery, that it was a stain on the Southern states alone. A review of these um, writings were republished during this past tumultuous year. And in a 2020 interview in the same newspaper, he recounts a conversation with a librarian about a Newport slave owner with sugar plantations in the West Indies. The librarian corrects him and says, he wasn't a slave owner, he was a merchant. Why is she so bent on not accepting that he was a slave owner, that he bought and sold people into bondage? The book White Fragility that many of you are aware of by Robin D'Angelo talks about our racial stamina. Not only have we not developed it, there are active attempts to prevent us from developing, developing it. What active attempts you say? House Bill 6070, prohibiting teaching of divisive concepts. 
To quote the bill, this act would prohibit the teaching of divisive concepts and would mandate that any contract, grant, or training program entered into by the state or any municipality include provisions prohibiting teaching divisive concepts and prohibiting making any individual feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any distress on account of their race or sex. What state do you say was this bill introduced? Rhode Island. When? March 2021. Currently, the current status of the bill is that is up for further discussion. Iowa has a similar bill before the Senate. But we saw this in the federal mandate that we all had to grapple with from the last administration in September 20th, in September 22nd, uh, 2020, designed very specifically to impact funding to federal contractors or anyone receiving federal grants, such as universities. I do love allegory and analogy as educational tools. I'm also among many, many other identities, a sci-fi nerd. The Matrix is a 1999 film written and directed by the Wachowskis. It stars Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne. Now everybody sees something different in the story of The Matrix, which is only part of its brilliance. The varying interpretations and use of the famed blue pill, red pill scene. I've always seen a depiction of racism and oppression in The Matrix. Perhaps that's my bias, and that's a fair comment. In the mid-2000s, Lana and Lily Wachowski both came out as trans women. I did feel somewhat validated when Lily Wachowski revealed in 2020 that, to, that the matrix is really a trans allegory. A statement about transformation and accepting yourself and the truth as you really are, despite society's and psychiatry's view that there is something wrong with you. Let's take a moment to look at this clip with the view of racism, transphobia, and feeling trapped in mind. Do you want to know what it is? The matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. <sighs> Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Follow me. I love the drama of that scene and I love the name of um, Lawrence Fishburne, um, Morpheus, God of Dreams. How do we know that the Wachowskis were making a subtle commentary about psychiatry in 1999? The character of the architect. The architect, this is his visual representation of the computer program that is running the world, deluding humans to believe that they are living freely, looks just like Sigmund Freud. If we use this allegory to discuss racism, that it has been baked into everything structurally, systemically, then it is only us 
as individuals that can change the narrative. We must be the resistance. I think that the analogy of the blue pill, red pill puts us more in control and squarely puts the choice on us. The only thing that I would add to this beautiful allegory is that the red pill is not a single dose, but a multi-dose path. It is not a one-time choice. Evidence of this is seen in the movie with another character that I'm fascinated by, Cypher. The member of the resistance who sells out his crew to be put, plugged back into the matrix because he does not like the reality of life that he sees. He would rather go back to sleep knowing that everything around him is not real. And he is willing to go to great lengths to get there. If you look at the matrix through the eyes of religion, specifically Christianity, and many have, Cypher is Judas, the betrayer. But in another sense, we can look at Cypher as us, the fragile human who has an inability to tolerate discomfort, change, growth, or the unfamiliar. Are we, as Morpheus Lawrence Fishburne says to Neo, Keanu Reeves, a slave? Perhaps not in the sci-fi sense of being in a pod and being used for food for the machines, which is a storyline from the movie. I'm sorry if you haven't seen it. But in the sense of not being free, not being free to think critically. We think of things as stagnant and fixed, history, language, academia. It is this way because it's always been this way. When we feel that change in some way dilutes us, changes us in a way we don't want to be changed. So we fight to stay the same. We seem to adapt more readily to things that make life easier for us, technology, for example, even though it may not always be good for us. Racism serves a purpose. It is not just the way it is, it is the way it was designed. In our patient example of someone avoiding dealing with trauma, it serves a purpose for that individual, protection of the self. At one level, racism does protect the self. It protects us from dealing with our original sin of slavery. It also protects certain people financially keeping the power and the perception of power in familiar places that brings comfort. Just like being the patient, avoiding acknowledging the trauma, the perception of what could happen if you open that Pandora's box could be worse than what they're experiencing now. So the motivation to change is minimal. We really need to ask ourselves, what purpose does racism serve for me? Me as an individual, if you ask yourself only one question after leaving here today, this would be the one. What purpose does racism serve for me, me as an individual? In 2003, the same year the Institute of Medicine's review came out about unequal treatment, the Sullivan Commission crafted this, this uh, document about missing persons, minorities in the healthcare professions, in the health professions. They actually went out and asked people in communities, in settings, what to do about the issue and had many recommendations. But one conclusion that is important to this group is that leadership matters. Specifically, academic medical leadership was determined to be one of the most critical elements in any efforts to diversify the health profession workforce. I want to remind you that they're talking about us that we are one of the most critical elements in the efforts to diversify the healthcare workforce. Some of the recommendations have been enacted in some places, some not broadly, there's incomplete penetrance here. Some have been not been enacted in meaningful ways at all. To focus specifically on one, again, remember this is 2003, 6.2, health professions, health profession schools and health systems should have strategic plans that outline specific goals, standards, policies, and accountability measurements and mechanisms to ensure institutional diversity and cultural competence. I would say that some people are starting to do this now, about 18 years later. And in some cases, we have proposed legislation and executive orders that directly oppose the recommendation of 6.1, the, the, devi the divisive uh, concepts, um, bills that have been put forth in various states, goes against 6.11. This is one of many feelings that Black people in America have. And I want to specifically talk about Black faculty, medical students, and residents in psychiatry, because somehow, if you achieve this level, you assume that something is different, and it's not. The feeling of invisibility persists because nothing's really changed. What does it mean to be invisible? 
Well, it took until 2019 to get a Band-Aid in someone's skin color. What does it do for a person when that first happens, when they feel seen, included? It's mostly overwhelming emotion, I can tell you, as evidenced by this tweet of a man who wore a Band-Aid for the first time in 2019 that matched his skin color. For those of you old enough to remember Crayola flesh tone colors, this is now called peach, but it was flesh tone. It was the flesh tone for everyone, every child. In the Crayola 64 box with the sharpener in the back, this was the skin color. And in 2020, 2020, Crayola came out with a broader spectrum of colors to try to more accurately represent the skin color of everyone. During my childhood, one antidote to the unrelenting assault to keep me from feeling invisible was Ebony Magazine. Ebony, for those of you who don't know, is a monthly magazine commenting on the current news events and black culture entertainment of the day. During its heyday, it reached 40% of the black American households in the United States, and one of them was mine. In cleaning out my parents' home recently, trying to debulk some of the things they have, there were several boxes of Ebony that I don't really have a need for, but couldn't get rid of and they're still there. Ebony was a relentless attack on invisibility of black people. It had the most positive portrayal of black Americans. Everybody in the magazine was black and it was very thoughtfully crafted. Currently, Ebony is not in print and they're looking to sort of uh, reboot, but I think it's in its seven, it was in its 75th year. It is online in some format, but not no longer being distributed in the, um, in a magazine format at this time, but hopefully it'll come back. Or this podcast done by a Brown medical student who was a diversity fellow with us in the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs about shade equity, a commentary about um, how there is profound racial injustice in the infrastructure of our country, how some streets are tree lined with parks and easy access to groceries, and others are a sea of concrete and asphalt, raising the temperature well over 10 degrees hotter than in the shade on a summer day or this compelling podcast that I encourage you to read, to listen to about Brown medical students, about what it's like to be black at Brown University Medical School, a podcast called First Reckonings. Consumer products, TV, film, books, aren't the only places we're invisible. It's also true in academic psychiatry. These are two companion articles that were recently published in um, the Green Journal in um, March, I believe. They describe some of the challenges of diversity in psychiatry and offer some solutions. The data that they present on promotion comes from the AAMC data, the American Association of Medical Colleges. With regards to psychiatry department chairs, white males comprise 61% of department chairs, compared with 17% for white women, 3.9% for Latino men, 1.9% each for Latino women and Black women and 0.6% for Black men. White male psychiatrists are promoted, were promoted to a full professor rank um, to assistant professor ratio of 0.74. So one would be everyone got promoted. 0.74 is white male psychiatrist. For white women, the ratio lagged far behind at 0.26, similar to Black men at 0.24. For BIPOC women, the full professor to assistant professor ratio was 0.14. And concerningly, the ratio for black women was 0.08. They also talk about in uh, their data about uncompensated DEI work, the diversity tax that everybody talks about. In 44% of their sample, albeit a small sample, um, the roles defined as vice or associate chairs, directors, and diversity ambassadors, or members or chairs of diversity committees, 44% of their sample went uncompensated. I'm hoping that you could see this a little bit. This is a table from the Jordan paper that lists specifics for DEI leadership efforts from financial support, professional development, and evaluation. The financial support is quite specific for a paper like this. It it, they really did collect the data of what people were reimbursed and paid and shared that information, which is not all that common to do in academic medicine, to professional development and how they think that these roles should go forward and who should be the signers on documents when something has to go out in the department and that person should never be alone. 
It should include all of the department leadership. Like our patient in the case example, which is really us, the mere mention of racism or racial injustice or of the quote unquote past sparks outrage or denial. In the podcast that has been removed from the JAMA network, statements were made that racism in medicine does not exist because no physician is racist. The deputy editor of this um, podcast, uh, Dr. Livingston, further commented that racism was outlawed in the 1960s with the Civil Rights Act. This is just a recent example in March of 2021 within the field of medicine of how our ignorance and fear of facing the truth keeps us ill. This link is the um, apology from the JAMA editor for that podcast. These are some of the statements made in my presence in the presence of colleagues that I spoke with on this topic. On the topic of promotion or seeking advancement, you don't understand how things work. What comes after that is not a description of how things work, but just a statement. There is no help in guiding the person about what it is that you're trying to get them to do, or you're not ready for promotion. And when you compare yourself as a person of color to what you see your colleagues getting promoted for, they, it doesn't add up you're equal to that, but promotion doesn't come. And the statement is, you're just not ready for promotion. On the topic of leaving the university, it'll not be, it won't be better there for you. It's the same everywhere you know. You'll never make it without me. I've done everything for you, why can't you see that? These are statements of ownership. And so I'm not sure why they're, they're happening, but they're happening in a, um, in a more predominant way to faculty of color when they decide that they want to leave. And again, on the topic of recruitment and acceptance of an underrepresented medicine trainee, I've heard this comment more often than I would like to admit about trying to diversify the um, residency or uh, medical school, how low do we have to lower the bar? Again, perpetuating this myth that there is something, something inherently wrong with a person of color and that we have to lower the bar in order to have to achieve equity. What are the consequences of these things? Mistreatment, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, anti-Asian sentiment, xenophobia, however we want to describe it, it is happening in medical schools and in the learning environments, which are also hospitals. This data is from 2020, but it is a review of the 2016-2017 double-AMC self-report graduate questionnaire. This is a survey that is sent to all graduates of medical schools in the United States every year. The entire paper has concerning results. Just in the type of mistreatment that they list as choices. Again, this is in medical school. How often were you publicly humiliated? How often were you threatened with physical harm? How often were you physically harmed? How often were you subjected to unwanted sexual advances or asked to exchange sexual favors for grades or other rewards? These are the questions on the mistreatment form that all medical students receive. Here we have it by binary gender, male, female. Just to give a bit of an example of how, what, what this data shows. I think this is the first time was looked at sort of by gender and um, uh, sexual identity and race in this paper. Um, but for men, they have been publicly humiliated ever in their, in their um, medical school career, 19.5%, 22.9% for women, which they found to be statistically significant. Threatened with physical harm, men more than women, 1.7 to 1.0. Subjected to unwanted sexual advances, 6.8% for women and 1.3% um, for men. But asked to exchange sexual favors for grade, about the same 0.2 and 0.3 for men and for women. If we look at this, the, the second question and look at the data by race and ethnicity as it relates to denied opportunities, subjected to offensive remarks and lower evaluations due to race and ethnicity, we see that for underrepresented in medicine students, 7.3% of them said that they have been denied opportunities for training or rewards based on race or ethnicity. Almost 19% have been subjected to race 
racially or ethnically offensive remarks or names. And about 23% uh, receive lower evaluations or grades solely because of their own race or ethnicity rather than performance. Instead of a cohort study analysis, how about an individual narrative? This is an article by one of our medical school graduates from Brown called Can a Woman of Color Trust Medical Education? She describes the changes that she saw in herself as a woman of color in medicine, starting to question if she should trust medical education to produce doctors who people like her would want to care for them. I found her article particularly compelling, perhaps because it was transparent, it was raw, and it was honest. It really left you nowhere to hide. She states that she is just as vulnerable to learning how to practice medicine that is complicit with social injustices as her white classmates are. She's human, she wants to belong, she's a student, and the teachers educating her are the ones she's supposed to trust and follow until she does not trust them anymore and does not follow them. I invite these voices into, uh, of these current and former students into this lecture today because you need to hear from them. We need to learn from them. I've joked with many of my colleagues and residents that if I were ever to write a book about medicine, the title would be Medicine, the Benevolent Cult. I guess I'm stuck on the word benevolent. At times it's kind and giving with a type of blind devotion to the way things have quote always been. As a profession, we don't interrogate ourselves very often. Dr. Blackstock penned this opinion piece for Stat News in 2020 and it went viral. It went viral because everyone could resonate with it. Dr. Blackstock called out hostile work environments, barriers to promotion, the diversity tax on black faculty, lack of mentorship and sponsorship and little progress in academia stated commitment to diversity and inclusion, all as reasons for leaving academia. It takes a very long time to produce a doctor. Can we really afford to lose some, particularly in academic medicine? Dr. Blackstock was not the only black physician who penned an opinion piece in 2020. Dr. Ruth Shim, a psychiatrist, listed structural racism within the APA as the reason that she decided to leave the organization. The APA Board of Directors apologized for its role in structural racism, stating, quote, the APA is beginning the process of making amends for both the direct and indirect acts of racism in psychiatry. The APA Board of Trustees apologizes to its members patients and their families and the public for enabling discriminatory and prejudicial acts within the APA and racist practices in psychiatric treatment for black, indigenous and people of color." Close quote. They went on to further apologize for their silence and an action that has allowed the perpetuation of structural racism. This apology came in January, 2021. Apologies are meaningful even if they're long overdue. But apologies alone are not enough. Remember the psychiatrist, the black psychiatrist who went to the APA in 1969. Let's have a visual interlude. This is a clematis from my garden. It didn't bloom this year. The, the, it didn't bloom the year before this. I was frustrated and I was gonna dig it up and get rid of it. But I decided to change the soil, add some nutrients and give it another try. And this is how I was rewarded and have continued to be rewarded. It is a reminder to me that there can be no change to the makeup of an organization without a change in the environment and nothing can grow. Often it's not the flower that's the problem, but the gardener. One of my biggest concerns is the next generation of physicians, of psychiatrists, the ones we're currently training to replace us. They're passionate about social justice. Never have I had more people come into my office and tell me about the groups that they wanna work with, the work that they've done, the degrees that they've earned prior to come to medical school to better have an understanding about social justice and health equity. If we don't create an environment now that supports these goals, what will they encounter? Will they leave medicine? Will they be forced to abandon their passion? Will they conform? Our actions today will have very lasting consequences. We cannot simply repeat the past. As a program director and educator, I try to weed through the sea of highly qualified applicants that apply to our residency program every year. By now I have a good sense of who we can work with within our program, what necessary ingredients I must have. The most important one to me is curiosity. 
curiosity is one of the things that draws some of us into medicine, asking questions such as, how does that work? Why is that? How can we fix it? What can we do? How can we prevent it? Why are we not curious about racism? How does that work? Why is that? How can we fix it? What can we do? How can we prevent it? Where's our curiosity about how to make things equitable, how to combat racism in medicine and specifically psychiatry? What is getting in the way? We've got to answer these questions or someone will be here in 2051 giving a similar presentation to this. This afternoon, we've traveled a bit of an arc that we've traveled before, but let me be blunt and specific if I haven't been already. When you cannot remember the name of a student, resident or faculty member, they're unseen. When you misgender someone, they feel unseen. When you spell their name wrong in an email, despite the fact that it's in the signature line and the from box, they feel unseen. When you mistake one black faculty member for another, when they look nothing alike, they are offended and feel unseen. When slaves were stolen from homelands and after stealing their bodies, they stole their names, identities, and histories. Don't replicate this with careless acts. This happens all the time in academic psychiatry. And when you are embarrassed by the fact that this happened, don't reach to blame them for being too sensitive. By mediocrity, I mean the stance we often take with this particular issue of diversity and inclusion and why we keep talking about it. We say, at least we're better than X university or department. We are at least doing this. By measure, we're doing better. Think bigger than that. Mediocrity is not the goal and it's nothing to be proud of. Have a retreat, take a look at what you wanna build and how you can not just keep up with the Joneses. Joneses. Avoid the knee jerk response, the DEI word of the day, the statement that you think having put out fixes everything. Focus on your department needs, do a needs assessment and a SWOT analysis. You're gonna to have to come to terms that it's gonna cost something. The cost is going to be necessary and it's gonna be worth it. See the full depth of your BIPOC talent pool. Not every BIPOC faculty member wants to be the vice chair of diversity. Perhaps they do. Perhaps they want to be the vice chair of education or chair of the department. Ask them what they want to do, what their goals are. Don't assume. This is something we don't do very well at all. And there's a reason for it. We don't want to know. We want to know something in medicine or psychiatry. We collect data on it. You have to collect data. You have to collect it and evaluate it. And while you're at it, you can also evaluate pay inequity that occurs in many academic universities. Exit interview your faculty if they're leaving. Create a space kind enough for them to tell you why they're leaving. And the vice chair of diversity should not be like the kids, like the kid at the kids table on holidays, in the room but minimized. They shouldn't just be commenting on issues that you deem to be diversity issues. All issues are diversity issues. You should be treated as a leader in the department to help propel these changes forward. The vice chair of diversity needs a tremendous amount of support, perhaps more than any of the other leaders in the department. This is not work to do alone. It's unbelievably challenging work and at times re-traumatizing. It shouldn't be done in isolation. I think the articles uh, from Jordan et al. and Alpha Stewart do help give specifics on this. I would encourage you, you to read them. Remain curious. Ask someone else how or what they need to achieve their goal or to be helped. Go to your community leaders. What are the community leaders in the community that need your help if it's not your own? To form a community action board, and you should pay them and get them to educate you about what you should be doing differently. As a specialty, we continue to perpetuate racism and injustice. To gain a better understanding of this topic and its underpinnings, I encourage you to read this book by Dr. Shim and Vincent. The book breaks down the issues of injustice and mental health into three parts. The foundations of social injustice, including social determinants, mental health inequities, and structural racism. The systems and structures of social injustice, such as the schooling system, the child welfare system, urban development, the carceral system, and the healthcare system. And the injustices of diagnosis and conditions, including substance use disorders, schizophrenia, personality disorders, and childhood trauma. It's a very helpful tool for those of you who teach any trainees. When I was young, I used to visit my aunt and uncle, a mechanic and a bookkeeper. I learned a lot from them, an awful lot from them. 
they used to save money in a jar in their bedroom. And when I asked them what they do with it, they say they go on vacation every year with the money. I thought they were crazy. It's just coins. Well, I grew up and I realized the full value of every cent. I've had this jar for many years in my bedroom. It looks mostly empty to you, I'm sure. But there's probably $800 in there. Enough for two plane tickets somewhere, just like my aunt and uncle said. The work against racism can be so overwhelming that we don't even try. We don't see things as they really are. We deflect the responsibility and we think our actions don't matter. But if we see that every action plays a role, we'll get somewhere. We all have a talent. There's something we do well. Perhaps we can evaluate data. Perhaps we can teach someone how to review an article. Perhaps we are really great at getting published and we can help someone get published and mentor them in that. You can read a book, challenge your thinking, learn someone's name, or take the time to understand their personal goals, not just the goals you have for them or assume about them. Join a committee, mentor a student, resident or faculty member. Bring forth an idea for change, creating an eddy, which is a current counter to the main current causing a whirlpool. Because we clearly do need that in academic psychiatry. The sidelines are no longer a place to be in academic psychiatry. What I'm telling you today is that we actually have to go against our training, our role models. We have to go against them. Against see one, do one, teach one. Because we never really saw anyone do this. We didn't really do it. And we don't know how to teach it very well. That's not going to suffice in this situation. It is at best woefully inadequate, and at worst, causing ongoing damage. Power, privilege, and access can feed our narcissism or change someone's life. Let's take off our cloak of benevolence that keeps us warm, safe, and dry when we're not in need of any of these things. When your position, finances, prestige, or already afford you these things, why don't we take off our cloak and wrap it around somebody else? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Guthrie. That was um, a really moving uh, presentation and um, uh, very powerful, at least for me. And so I invite people to put questions in the Q&A box, but I'm going to start with a question, for Dr. Guthrie, and I know that there's no simple answer for this, so I just welcome your thoughts or reflections or comments. But, you know, the, the example that you gave you know, way back in 1970, sounds like it applies to today. That's 51 years ago. Yep. And, uh, and in some ways, maybe not much has changed. And so you gave us some ideas about change and you talked about get data. And one of the things I'm curious about is how do we measure progress? What are, what are some metrics because it's kind of like when, when a patient comes in with high blood pressure, you have to get data, you have to measure that blood pressure, but then you need to follow them up and make sure that whatever treatment you're prescribing is actually working. And, uh, and if the treatments aren't working, you need to change course and modify your treatment. So what, how do we really measure progress? I think that one of the mistakes that most departments or universities make is they take other people's metrics and try to use them as their own. So they say, well, that looked great. Let's, let's do that. And let's bring that here when it may not fit you. So I think the first thing to do is try to, um, as I said, do a retreat, do something to look at what, what would we be proud of in five years, in 10 years? What's our goal? If you have a uh, department that has um, some diversity in it, speak to those people about why they're there, why they stay, and, and try to ascertain is your goal to recruit, is your goal to retain, is your goal to increase numbers, is your goal to educate the faculty? Do you think we can't recruit or retain until we educate the faculty? Because in some cases, no one thinks this is a problem. So if no one thinks it's a problem, it's gonna be very hard to say we're gonna diversify the, um, the department. So what you'll do is you'll just recruit people in the department that won't stay because you haven't done the work internally to take a look at what's the environment that you're putting this person into. Is it a toxic environment? Is someone misidentifying them all the time? So I really think that has to start with 
time to introspect. What is it that you want to try to accomplish? Not what the criteria is from uh, what the ACGME wants you to do or the AAMC wants you to do or the Joint Commission. What do you want to do? What are you going to be proud of? And you're going to find that you're just, there's going to be differences there. And you're going to have to you're figure out that you're going to have to figure out how to come together. So you may need to do some internal work first because you can't, that's why you may never get there because no one believes it's a problem. So the answer is it's not a one size fits all piece of data. You've got to do the work to try to ascertain where you want to go. And that gives you a sense of purpose and meaning as opposed to, well, this is great. We recruited, you know, um, three women of color and uh, we're good. And then you just sort of rest on your lungs. And your metrics have to be very, very individualized. We have a lot of comments coming in, just thanking you for a great presentation, emotional, inspiring. But I would love to encourage people watching this. Let's have a real discussion. This is a great opportunity. And I can't help but notice that not one person has put a question into the Q&A box. And I actually see that as maybe for two possible reasons, being the psychiatrist kind of trying to come up with a differential diagnosis of what is going on here right now in this moment. And I think maybe Dr. Guthrie, you gave a very powerful presentation that has some people kind of stunned and in their tracks and speechless, so to speak. Um, and maybe there's a sense of helplessness and a, a sense of futility. And yeah, 51 years have gone by and are we ever gonna do anything? And what, what can any of us do about any of this? Right. Um... Oh, Dr. Guthrie, you muted yourself. I, sorry about that, thank you. I, at times, uh, share that feeling. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of passivity around this topic because people feel, as I said, a little judged. They feel, if I say something, it's gonna be taken the wrong way. So we can't have a, we're still very scared to have a frank conversation about it. And um, I also think that uh, that's a shame. And um, I also think that sometimes it does mean that we have to maybe make a misstep in order to move forward. And missteps are okay. So I am looking and we've got a couple of people raising their hands. So I think they wanna actually speak. So I'm gonna promote them and allow them to speak live with us. So for those of you, Arthur Siegel, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, no? Someone wants the st uh, stuff put back up. Let me see if I can do that again. So we do have a question. Um, is there a way that you would recommend responding to a microaggression that is witnessed against a person in one's presence? Uh, yes. Um, so I'll just sort of scroll through these a little bit and then I'll go back to the top and then scroll through again. Um, so that it turns out that takes a tremendous amount of practice to do. Um, and so there's bystander sort of training for that. It turns out we're not really good at it. Um, sometimes we're good at it if we're the powerful person in the room, if we're uh, talking to, um, you know, a trainee, or if we're talking to someone who is an equal, but if we are speaking to our chair, we may not feel so empowered. And so we may be worried about how this will go. I think that if you don't know what to do, the worst thing that you could do is do nothing and not go and speak to the individual. So even if you don't act in that moment, go find that person later and say the truth. I was uncomfortable with that. I think that I didn't know what to do and I'm sorry about that, but I wanna see if you're okay. What this does, it, it takes that person who was invisible, visible, 
And so now someone saw this, someone saw that it was, it was real and that it was painful. And that person just doesn't just have to live with that alone. And then you ask them what they need. You don't assume what they need. They could be stunned too. They might need a minute to process and maybe you follow up with them in a day or so. Give them a little time to sort of figure things out. There's nothing that's ever going to be wrong with that. People are going to feel seen. And then as you work on this, you can sort of call people out in um, uh, promotions committees. I noticed that we took this, this uh, we made an exception for this male applicant for promotion, but we're saying something completely different about this female applicant. I've noticed that you didn't really give the same amount of time or thought to this medical student because they're older. Are we, are we holding that against this person? You're rating for this, you're rating for this, um, this applicant is lower, which I've been called out on. So there, no one is immune to this in any way, shape or form. And um, I prefer to be called out on it, but you have to get comfortable with uh, being wrong. Thank Bystander you. training can be very helpful. It, it is a helpful thing to, having been through it, it's a very helpful thing to practice. So we, we have a, a couple more questions coming in the queue. Um, thank you again for an outstanding presentation. What gives you hope at this time in 2021 that someone isn't going to be giving this identical presentation in 2070? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm an eternal optimist. I, I actually do think that it's not that there haven't been any changes in life. I mean, obviously there's been significant improvements and, you know, I think back to a meeting I had talking and hashing out the curriculum of medical students and how there was a lot of misinformation being taught um, about race-based medicine. And the committee was very frustrated. They made all these changes and they were like, what is it that the students want? And my answer was everything that you have, everything, not just some of it, all of it. And um, I believe it helped that individual see that this, this, in, this incremental feeding of like, we gave you this, you should be happy, was a, was a mindset that was sort of plaguing him because it had been his experience. This is what you do, right? As an educator, you give a little bit, don't give too much, because what, what could happen then? We have to change the mindset. The, the thing that gives me hope right now is that I'm exceptionally fortunate to work with and be surrounded by other uh, women of color at Brown. That is, I cannot underestimate how that is probably prolonging my career right now. That, that situation alone is probably single-handedly prolonging my career so that I don't wind up writing uh, an op-ed piece for Stat News saying that I'm leaving. So that that is extremely helpful. Mentorship, sponsorship, these are incredibly important things um, to a population that doesn't feel wanted at times within academic medicine and psychiatry. Great. This next question is a really important one as I think even more about it. So um, this person asks, I, you know, I'm not in a leadership role. And I feel pushback or ambivalence about that. Do you have thoughts about how people that are not in leadership roles can initiate change? And, and I wanna add to that because as I reflect on the last five or 10 years at our own institution, I think about some of the young trainees who were quite passionate about making change while they were here. And most of them have gone. They burned out quickly. They became frustrated, discouraged, hopeless, pretty quickly and said, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm moving on. So what, how do we, how do we balance that? How do, how do people not in leadership positions make change, but how do we make it a marathon as opposed to a quick sprint flash in the pan and then I'm burned out, I'm done. 
this, this is too onerous. There's not enough change quick enough. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so I'll, I'll define leadership a little bit more broadly. I do think that, um, I do think that we, we can all be leaders in a particular way. Even if you're, if you're a, a trainee, you can treat a med student well. If you're a med student, you could treat all of the staff well. If you see someone who identifies different than you, you can see them and acknowledge them. Those things do matter in the learning environment. And if you don't know, if you, you, you may have more access than other people have about information. We do a terrible job of sharing information about how to get somewhere. It's like there's an elevator to the penthouse, but it's like in a hotel where there's a key card, but you don't know there's a key card. You don't exactly know where the elevator is. Even if you're supposed to have access, no one tells you where the elevator is. So I do think that we've got to share information more equitably. Um, in our departments. It shouldn't just be who you know or how you know them that allows you to gain that access of opportunities, fellowships, um, you know, uh, how to get to conferences and how to get them funded and paid for, how to bring a student with you to a conference. Leadership absolutely matters. I mean, if we didn't learn that over the last four years, I don't know what we've learned, that leadership actually matters. It can be, it can be fundamental and you have to hold leaders accountable. And I think that there can be a passivity around that. And um, that can get very frustrating. I, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a brilliant answer for it. if the leaders who are responsible for this aren't doing nothing, how to make that change, which is why people leave. That's why people leave when they burn out. So I am just in leadership. Yeah, I am uh, mindful of the time and I want to be respectful of your time. We've gone just a little bit over one. So I want to make sure if you've got something else going on, you can get back to it. But I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, and on behalf of our institution um, for sharing your thoughts and wisdom. And I know you put so much work into this, much more than most other people put into their grand round. So I really, really thank you for everything that you've offered us today. And it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye.